All right, so um, just to recap where we, where we are, we are going to finish up chapter 13. The heart is, I'd say, pretty darn important uh, to your body, so we can't just turn and burn, even though technically we should cover this in the second unit. We need to get it all done, so we're going to go ahead and, and address it uh, now. So we'll wrap up chapter 13, the, the, um, the heart, which is the primary organ, I guess, of your, your uh, circulatory system. We introduced chapter 13, but we certainly didn't completely cover it. And so we're going to go back and review uh, that sequence of excitation to the intrinsic conduction system. So we'll pick up that just to refresh our memory. And then we're going to talk about this thing called the, car uh, the cardiac cycle and correlate that with um, the intrinsic conduction system and the uh, electrocardiogram, which we introduced in lab. And the pressure changes that happen inside of the body. Uh, Inside of the heart, excuse me, during a, a beat of the heart. We're going to review intrinsic and extrinsic control of the heart, which should be really familiar, coming off of chapter uh, 12, uh, how our other muscles are controlled. And then elaborate more exactly how the autonomic nervous system can influence some things of the heart, including afterload, preload, and contractility. So let's just recap. Uh, we crash coursed through the sequence of excitation through the heart, but we didn't really fully talk about it, and there were some questions, and I said, well, I'll get back to those after the test, so that's why we're here. Uh, the first thing is, we know that the heart is intrinsically controlled by a group of cells called pacemaker cells. They establish the rhythmic pace of contraction. So the heart, so the heart works together as a single unit, so it's very analogous to single unit through muscle, but it's not smooth muscle, it's cardiac muscle, okay? so the mechanics operate differently. And then we went through the sequence of excitation, we talked about the SA node, the AV node, the bundle, and the branches, and the tendinitis, and then we left off, so, well, exactly how do those uh, depolarizations uh, conduct from, say, the right atrium where they initiate over to the left atrium? And um, there's a specialized set of cells called conducting fibers that physically connect from the atria, from the right atria, over to the left atria. They're not pacemaker cells, they're not, what? They're not pacemakers and they're not, they're not contractile cells, they're called conducting fibers. They're sort of, they're kind of like pacemaker cells, but they're not leaky, they just are connected by what? Yeah. By gap junction. So they just physically allow for the spread of potential changes um, throughout the heart. Their anatomical location is implied where the yellow arrows are. And so if I want to spread potential from the right atrium over to the left atrium, those conducting fibers are called the interatrial pathways. So they're just there conducting. And this is important so that when the right atria depolarizes, so does the left atria. Okay, so they're all going to physically excite and do what at the same time? Excite and contract. Okay, well, both atria physically doing the same thing at the same time. The way we can see this done is by this internodal or these conducting cells that just spread the, the depolarization event throughout the heart. The use of conducting fibers okay? Any questions about it? These conducting fibers also then would extend to another set of cells which are called the AV node and they are also another set of pacemaker cells. They will spontaneously uh, depolarize and generate the pace of contraction for the rest of the heart. And so they will generate an action potential and those fibers, these conducting fibers, then extend between the ventricles. What is the name of these conducting fibers between the ventricles? The what? The bundle of hips. The bundle of hips. Okay, the bundle of hips is the next part of this conduction sim, uh, system inside of the heart. Okay. The potential spread, and we know that um, the bundle will branch to go to the left and right sides of the ventricles. And then the very ends 
of the branches, the very ends of them are called the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers are just the terminal little conducting fibers that reach more of the contractile cells. So they just want to get a, 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 a widespread excitation throughout the heart. So it's not just compartmentalized, so it really spreads out. The rest of the heart, and so we see the actual potentials conduct through the septum and then from the bottom and up. So what happens when we excite the heart through the middle and then from the bottom and up? It pushes blood out because after the excitation, the muscle cells will, the contractile cells will, they first have to contract. And so as the depolarization spreads through the heart, those re respective neighboring contractile cells contract. And we do see that the heart contracts from the bottom up because why? It, it does push the blood. Why do we want to see it go bottom up on an interval? To get it out. And so the only out is where? On the top of the ventricle, right? So that's where your pulmonary artery and your aorta like, are located on the respective uh, ventricles. So we want to squeeze the ventricles bottom up so they can push open uh, the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve to get blood out into the respective surface. I know we're going to go here in just a second, but I just want to uh, get you warmed up a little bit. When the SA node depolarizes and the potential changes over or <coughs> conducted over to the left atrium, and we were measuring the EKG, what part of the EKG waves do we pick up when we have this spread from the right to the left atrium? So which one? The T wave. And then we see it spreading through the um, ventricular septum. We would see the, the QRS. What terms could we use when the chambers are contracting? Systole. And when they're relaxing? Diastole. When a chamber is relaxing, what's happening to the blood? The chamber is filling up with blood. If it's filling up with blood, the pressure is the blood pressure in that chamber is probably lower. And if the chamber is contracting, it's emptying. It's emptying. So it is squeezing on it. Anything's happening to the pressure. It's an emptying. The blood volume, the blood pressure is continuously changing within the chambers of the heart. And that's what we're going to correlate um, coming up in a couple of minutes. The Purkinje fibers uh, were really illustrated by some yellow arrows in the, in the textbook, and we really know that they don't look like that. And so I found um, an image in the old web, and uh, it highlights the histology of these conducting cells and these Purkinje fibers. It's a cross section or a, a section of the heart. Just like any other microscope image you've seen before, the more dense, densely occupied the cell is with content, it looks darker. And then less simply occupied it is a content that looks lighter. And so you can see the same thing here. This section of the heart, we have our different layers. We have um, the myocardium, that's the what? The muscle. Okay. Then we have our Purkinje fibers and then the endocardium, so also the cardiac connective tissue. And if you know, it's already been kind of highlighted for us, but uh, even if it weren't highlighted, you should be able to appreciate a uh, a coloration difference between the areas one and three in you know, the muscle versus the conducting fibers, these Purkinje fibers. And so the Purkinje fibers are there to conduct and spread active potential to the adjacent myocardial cells. Are you able to see that visual difference at all? Okay. joked yesterday and it's not really a joke but we can't get away from an action potential right we're talking about we're still talking about muscles and when you look at the action potentials in your pacemaker cells they're different everything's got its own uniqueness they're just some concepts are the same but 
so the details are different. And so I want you on your on your uh, guided notes, I know it's labeled for you, but I want you to go ahead and put on the top, right at the top, pacemaker cell. I want you to label that potential change pacemaker cell, like in your SA notes or the AD notes. Because the active potential of a pacemaker cell is very different than the active potential of a uh, myocardial contractile cell. They're different. Just like we saw in our pacemaker cells in our blue bucket, we see the same type of spontaneous depolarization in the pacemakers of the heart. And the same thing, we have this, this is referred to as a slow wave depolarization. Because your pacemaker cells are leaky. Do I know what they're leaky to? Calcium. Good old calcium. Calcium coming in from the extracellular fluid leaks into your pacemaker cells, the SA nodes. We add uh, calcium into the cell, the cell reaches what? Threshold, and then we can generate an active potential. Goes back to rest, and then leaks calcium back up to threshold, generate. It just continues because these are the pacemaker cells. They just spontaneously just leak calcium across the threshold. What type of control is this? It's the source of intrinsic control for the heart. What we'll add in just a minute is we can extrinsically override this. With what? The beta... The vagus nerve, right? Comes from which nervous system? Yes. Yes. What subdivision? It's parasympathetic. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But so not only can the vagus nerve provide parasympathetic control, we know that the autonomic nervous uh, sympathetic nervous system can also override it. We'll, we'll come back to that. I just want to um, get you thinking ahead. Okay, so our intrinsic uh, source of pace of depolarization is initiated by the pacemaker cells because they're leaky too. Calcium. Calcium. Okay. The action potentials of your contractile cells of the heart, is, it looks quite different. Okay. So everything else is, uh, let me clarify this, during your pacemaker potential depolarization happens what we're familiar with, sodium flooding, which way? In repolarization through potassium exiting. Near the cell. All right, so all that's familiar, similar. Okay. If we contrast the action potential of a pa excuse me a contractile cell, it looks really different. It doesn't look like probably anything that we've seen before. Um, so on your guided notes, be sure to label this as a contractile cell. And then the bulk of the heart is made up of contractile cells. And something looks to look pretty odd or unique here. Either way, the cell is going to have to depolarize beyond its what? Threshold. And our familiar sodium causes depolarization in your contractile cells. After depolarizing, depolarization, the cell will uh, begin to repolarize, but then this unique plateau phase can be observed within the heart. We need to keep it in this depolarized, excited state. What can we do to keep your contractile cells in this depolarized state? Summation. We don't want to see summation of the muscle cells of the heart. We'll talk about that coming up. What could the, what could the contractile cells do to maintain this Okay, so you can block potassium. What else? This is just slow it down. Uh, so yeah, so you can say slow block potassium, slow it down. Those are each reasonable, but not not it. Okay, so what's what's a what's another option? I want to keep it at what charge? I want to keep it, but depolarized it needs to be positive. How can I keep 
this positive state. If I'm already using sodium, I'm already using Also, let in calcium to maintain this plateau phase to sustain the depolarization period for which is a private state for a period of time. Not real long, but long in terms of actually printing the paper. Then what do we? We need to finish doing what? Need to repolarize and get back to resting membrane potential. So the contractile cells, their active potential is really unique in that they have a what? A plateau phase where it becomes permeable to, more permeable to. The natural question is then, well, then why is that there? Okay. There is a reason. Do they know why that is there? The plateau phase caused by calcium. And hopefully, calcium is always ever present in your body. But the why we're going is what's the point of that plateau phase? We're maintaining a, a state of what? Depolarization, excitation. If it's already excited, what can it not do? Re-excite. Re Why do you not want to re-excite a muscle cell that just got fatigued or even? What does this muscle cell have? The heart. So what? Is capable to relax, so it doesn't undergo what? Yeah. The word you used earlier is summation. You do not want your heart muscle contractions to sum together. You don't want you don't want summation in the heart. You want the heart to contract and then relax, and then contract and then relax. You don't want it to contract and stay contracted and stay contracted and stay contracted. What's going to happen? All the blood's out, and it's not pumping, but doing its work, so it really tries all over there. And so to prevent that in summation, the muscle cells have a plateau phase. So we'll come back and we'll correlate that. Um, in just a moment with, uh, I think, figure 1318. Okay. What questions do you have about differentiating a pacemaker potential versus that of a contractile cell? I want to now turn our attention to uh, figure 1314, just visually showing um, the excitation contraction coupling. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because it's quite similar to what we already covered in the skeletal muscle. Uh, any of the contractile cells, they've got to get excited and depolarize the threshold, however it may be, through um, uh, the spread by gap junctions or maybe either directly, right, the sympathetic nervous system. But either way, the cell is going to depolarize to threshold. That depolarization is going to open up. What, what other ion do you need to add in here? Calcium. That grading of the threshold will allow calcium to come in from the what? Extracellular fluid. So very much like we saw in the smooth muscle, calcium floods into the cell and causes what? Not quite. It's working in there, but we also we let calcium in from the extracellular fluid. We also get calcium from the the SR. Okay, so the same type of secondary release of calcium. Yes, it is.
predominantly from the extracellular fluid, uh, like your smooth muscle, your client muscle. But it, like the two muscle, it does have the two, two portions attached to it. But because the thin and thick filaments are built analogous to your skeletal muscles, so they have sarcomeres and G-lines and etc., calcium not only maintains the plateau phase, but it also does what? Binds to troponin, which pulls back dopamycin, which exposes the myosin binding site so that myosin can attach. You know, we need to have already split what? And continue to be the palatoscope. So the same type of concept happening uh, in the skeletal muscles. Uh, uh, excuse me, between the skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle. Okay, so we still have a very similar cross bridge cycle. I saw an article published on social media yesterday, and I shared it maybe this morning or yesterday sometime, and it was looking at the anatomy of the G-lines in the cardiac sarcomere. So if you're on social media, you might want to check out my, uh, if you're curious about the, the sarcomere arrangement in the heart, uh, go to my page, and I'm pretty sure I shared it. I don't know, but um, I tried anyway. But you might want to check it out if you're curious about it. What questions do you have about the excitation of the cardiac muscle as well as the physical contraction of the contractile muscle? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the EKG events can be correlated with what's physically happening in the heart. And so uh, we became familiar with the EKG a couple of weeks ago in last. And now we're going to uh, reiterate that when you're measuring someone's EKG, you're measuring at the surface of the body. You're measuring at the surface. So when you look at an EKG output, you're not looking at an action potential. So I want you to really make that differentiation. That an EKG is not an action potential. It's a result of it, but it's not, not probing the, the, uh, the patient's heart, for example. We can measure just so much muscle mass to the heart, we can pick up its electrical changes at the surface of the body. And so the equipment that we used was certainly uh, not hospital grade, but it was sufficient enough to pick out the time uh, that your heart spent in each of the, the phases of EKG waves. When you go to work in a clinic, so you're going to have more than the three leads uh, that we had in that. And if we were to correlate, looking at um, figure 1316, we're looking at the EKG in the blue plot below, and then look at it aligned with the physical potential changes of the heart or the contractile cell, you'll notice that when the cell depolarizes, so um, that correlates with the large ventricles of the heart. So notice that when the ventricles are depolarizing, we start the what? PRS complex. While we're in the plateau phase, the cell begins to go and finish up the PRS complex and then go into the what? T wave. So while this plateau phase is happening, the ventricles contract and then relax. Then the PRS complex, they go on to the ventricular, and then the T wave, and uh, diastole. So notice this, then let that continuation take place. Let the ventricles contract and relax before a new threshold is attained. This should hopefully solidify the role of the, the plateau phase. Make sure the ventricles go through contraction and relaxation is where you contract because we don't want our heart muscles to contraction. We don't want the heart muscle contractions to sum together. We don't want those to sum together. Why don't you go ahead and test yourself and label the phases of an EKG on uh, that figure 1316 in your lab manual or textbook, whatever that is, your guided notes. During the P wave, which chambers are active? 
the atrium. Very good. Electrically begin to depolarize. Very good. While physically we're going to contraction. So what phase should we say? Systole. So I mean not only do they contract, they're also pushing blood to the where? To the ventricle. So again, during the P wave, the atria <coughs> depolarize and are in systole. The next phase is called a complex because multiple things are happening in a really short window of time. Very important things <coughs> happen. So during the QRS complex, we'll talk about the atria first. And let me let me clarify something. I'm talking about plurality. So each the right and the left atria are doing it. So during the QRS complex, the atria must then repolarize, repolarize and then begin to enter diastole. diastole. So during the QRS complex, during the Q wave, the, the atria repolarize and then enter into diastole, which means they are now relaxing and settling the blood. Right on top of that, the big, huge, giant ventricles are also, they are depolarizing. They will begin to contract to finish it. So we say they are in what? Again, how do you want to know this? I think everybody knows the ventricles. So the ventricles are in which state? They're depolarizing and physically in systole, which means they are contracting and pushing blood. Which circuit? Means they're going to generate enough force to open the valve and push blood out to which circuit? The pulmonary, pulmonary and systemic circuit. So after the QR is complex, the ventricles depolarize the threshold and physically enter into systole. The next series of events is the P wave, where both ventricles electrically depolarize and enter into. Repolarize. You guys looked it up. I didn't know that. Yes, they, the ventricles will repolarize. I misspoke. Thank you for catching me. They diastole. They repolarize and enter into diastole, where they can relax and fill with blood. Fill with blood, and they'll stay relaxed and filling with blood until when? When the the next Q and actually the QR is complex. So even though your ventricles have a really, really important job of pushing blood out to the pulmonary systemic circuit, it doesn't take them very long compared to the rest of the heart cycle. The bulk of the time, the ventricles are doing what? Filling and relaxing. And a tiny amount of the time, they're contracting and systole. You can check your work. I think I got it summarized here. Oh, actually has a text I was looking for. Uh, this next image uh, is a straight from good old Wikipedia, but it looks pretty darn good. It's correlating the physical events with the electrical events. The electrical changes are measured with the little red lines. You can see physically how the atria uh, either are in a relaxed state or a contracted state. The same thing for the ventricles. That image is overlying an EKG wave. So let's uh, let's go full cycle. EKG wave, and now we'll start with the new P wave. Coming up. So during the P wave, SA nodes you can see the internodal pathway. So both the atrix are excited at the same time, and now we have got to spread that potential to the septum and then from bottom up, so the heart contracts bottom up. Um, we'll wrap out with the P wave here. So let's go back. First thing is P wave. Atria depolarize and enter into systole. P 
You are a complex atrium, three polarized diastole, while the ventricle is depolarizing the atrium, distally, and it will crank out the T waves in the ventricle going to the space. Diastole and the axis. So even though um, the EKG is not an intracellular measurement, it certainly is indicative of what's happening physically at the heart. What questions do you have about the, um, the EKG or its uh, sequence of events? All right. Um, now what I want to do is uh, use figure 1318 to correlate those physical events with volume and pressure changes. Uh, within the heart. The image is tiny. Um, it doesn't project very well, so I'll enlarge it in just a second, um, kind of pick it apart. But this is the raw image from figure 1318. There's a lot going on, which tells us we can take a lot of information about what's happening within a single uh, heartbeat. All of the events of a single heartbeat are called the cardiac cycle. Okay, so it's going to correlate the physical events and the electrical events that we guys talked about. And now what's going to be new to us uh, is the volume and pressure changes that happen in the chambers uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. Which you guys kind of have an idea. The chamber is relaxing, it's, the volume is, the blood volume is increasing, and uh, if the chamber is contracting, the volume of blood is decreasing. And so it's just constantly changing. Just add, take, add, take. We also know that if you add blood to a chamber, the blood pressure will go up and if you take within the chamber, and if you take blood out of that chamber, the blood pressure will go down. And so you just gotta think about physically where these where this blood volume is, is moving. It's just changing from chamber to chamber to circuit to circuit with, with each with each beat. Other correlations with figure 13 are whether or not the valves are open or closed. We introduced this one and wraps up chapter 13 with what it has. We know that when the AV valve is open, the semilunar valve should be closed and vice versa. So we'll come back to that. And then in lab, we talked about the heart sound uh, when the blood kind of you know, moves between the chambers and into the different circuits. And on the very bottom is correlating a, a, an EKG with these events. And so if you look at the cardiac cycle, it's referred to as a cycle because you can start anywhere studying it. We've got four chambers, they're either going to be contracting or relaxing, so you can pick up wherever you want. Most people, when they're trying to describe the cardiac cycle, just originate when the ventricles are in diastole. When the ventricles are in diastole, and you say, oh, well, then the next thing must be, the atrium must be in what? Systole, then we just alternate. So, um, if the ventricles are in diastole, we know that the ventricles are what? They're filling, filling up with blood. So when the ventricles are in diastole, they're filling, so the AV valve must be open, but the semilunar valves to the respective circuits probably should be closed. If it's filling, the volume of blood would be minimal, but we're at, right, we said, Increase. And when in diastole, it's like you're pouring into a cup. You start out low and you add. Right? So that's what's happening inside of the ventricle. So the green line is illustrating the volume of blood inside of the ventricle. So during diastole, you see by this first column, the first kind of pieces of time, the AV valves are open, the semilunar valves are closed. I'll come back here. The volume of blood is beginning, it's lower, but it's beginning to increase. Okay. And as we finish ventricular diastole, the atria are beginning to get into what? Systole. Another thing on this image is correlating the aorta. Right? So we can think outside of uh, the heart itself, the pressure inside of the aorta, the pressure inside of the ventricles, and the pressure inside of the atria. So, can y'all see this at all? Do I need to enlarge this? What was it? You're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I th it's gonna, it's gonna mess up the text. Let me 
It's okay. This will help. All right. So if you look at the, is this, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. So this is the cardiac cycle. It's just illustrating that the ventricles uh, will alternate from diastole to systole to diastole, as will also the atrium. will be alternating from diastole, systole, diastole. Okay. When the chambers alternate, they their state they are either filling with blood or emptying with blood. Okay, so that's what we're correlating here. Um, if an atria contracts, blood is being pushed to the respective ventricle, and if a ventricle contracts, it's pushing blood to the respective circuit, either the aorta that's coming from the left ventricle or the uh, pulmonary artery that's coming from the right ventricle. Okay, so. Um, we're correlating these physical events with the valve, with the other uh, pressure changes inside of it. Are we okay with where we're at? Transitioning. Below, so this is 1320 is a section of that enlarged. Okay. In the phase one, two, three, four, whatever. Okay. However you want it shows us what I prefer to use to truly die fully the coronary. And also another disclaimer is once when the textbooks can talk about diastole or systole and they don't talk about a particular chamber, they're probably talking about which chamber? Which one? The left one. The left ventricle kind of gets all the accolades. Because why? It sends blood to the whole body. It sends blood to the entire systemic circuit. That's not undermining the right ventricle, it's not undermining the left or the, or the right atrium, but it's just because we can measure it easily the pressure and the events in the rest of the body. So we turn our attention usually to the left ventricle. Uh, so that's why this is focusing on the aortic valve, the valve that sends blood out of the left ventricle to the systemic circuit. So if the ventricle is relaxing and filling, the blood pressure is probably going to be a little bit lower. As the ventricle contracts, it, enter, it must be entering what? If we're increasing the pressure on this volume of blood. Systole. Okay, so we can, if we have a volume of blood, we squeeze on it, the pressure will go up. Concept is very similar to what we just saw in the respiratory system last week. You have a set volume of blood, you decrease the volume or the area which it can, uh, can, can occupy, the pressure goes if I've got a volume of blood in my left ventricle and I squeeze on it, my valves are closed. So while my valves are closed and I'm squeezing on it, the pressure goes up. Eventually, the pressure is going to be enough to now open up the valve. But we're still squeezing, so we're continuing to increase the pressure. Eventually, the blood is going to be ejected out into the aorta, and so the pressure within the ventricle would obviously drop. Not only do we push out the blood, the heart is, the ventricle is beginning to now relax, and so the pressure should plummet until it adds more stuff. And then we can increase the pressure, but first we gotta get the blood in there. Um, we had not done this before, but talking through this image real quick, I want you to, um, right here, when the heart transitions uh, during the systole, when the ventricles are systole, uh, there's a transition where, the, where the, the aortic valve has to open, right? There's a certain pressure that the ventricles have to overcome to open up that valve. Okay, so the ventricle is responsible for this. If it doesn't generate enough pressure, the aortic valve is not going to open. Okay, so it's got to generate enough, enough pressure. There. So put a scar here. We'll see how this works. We'll put a scar here, right where that transitions to the opening. And what we're going to talk about in just a second is called after mode. The after mode. Yes. I'm going to show just a word out there for right now, and I'll clarify it at the end of this chapter. And it is due to pressure. 
expression of the alloy that you see. So the word I just want to introduce is called after mode. Does it have any adjunct mode or after? It's actually it's, it's ever present, okay. but I want to turn your attention at this point to the ventricle is going to have to overcome the after mode to do what? Okay. Open the valve and push blood out into the It's in the ventricle, we need to open the aorta and push the blood out into the aorta. So the question is, is that just when it's present? No, afterload is ever present, but during ventricular systole, the ventricles have to overcome that. And I'll clarify that. We're just putting the word out there for right now. Okay? What is the word? Afterload. We'll come back to that. So the correlation is, so when the ventricles are relaxing, they're filling up with blood, so the blood pressure is very low. They're going to they're gonna enter into systole, but just because the chamber is in systole, it's not automatically going to open the valve. It's got to generate enough pressure to overcome the, now we're going to say, afterload and push blood out into the through, across the valves and into the aorta. If you're looking at the systemic state. There's uh yes. The question would be the would be the pressure the afterload be different between the systemic and the pulmonary circuit? The answer is definitely yes, and that ties back into the anatomical differences between the left and right human uh, ventricle. You remember the left, left ventricle is physically larger, it's got to generate more pressure, not only to overcome the afterload, but also to propel that long distance. The afterload in the lungs isn't as high, or the, yeah, in the uh, pulmonary circle, it's lower. But it's still present, it still has to be overcome, but not just a pure form of So we pump blood out into the aorta, so our blood volume is naturally going to be less in the ventricle. And so we have to fill it back up. Uh, we'll turn our attention to you real quick, though. What happens to the blood pressure in the aorta? It is, how can we describe it? It's what? It's increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing and we would describe that as what? Fluctuating. Fluctuating, and in the heart, we are you measuring the respiratory, the cardiovascular system, we would call that your what? If you're, the, the pressure fluctuates, so I can measure your pulse, it's pulsating. The blood in the aorta is pulsating, depending on whether the ventricle is contracting or Relaxing. It's alternate with the status of the ventricle. If we turn to figure 1321, oh, oh, all right. Real quick, we'll label this on here. Uh, the greatest pressure that you could measure at the aorta is what? What is this pressure? Systolic pressure. If you were to measure the pressure following ventricular systole, that's going to be the greatest amount of pressure that your body could, could generate. We just mentioned, though, the pressure is fluctuating, so it's going to go down a little bit. We would call that the diastolic pressure. Do we always reach the maximum amount of pressure? Like, is every pump the exact same amount of pressure? No. We did the exercise when we measure our blood pressure. Uh, it's variable, really from moment to moment, sleeping, standing. It should be pretty much at a steady state, though. You don't want your blood pressure to go from 120, 180, 160. You don't want to see it fluctuate like that, but you should see steady state. If you're sitting, 120 or whatever. So, so we can still use the word steady state in homeostasis, but certainly it can change based on if you're sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. So that, that can, that can, those can be upper limit and lower limit. So the highest pressure is the what? 
the solid pressure, and the lowest would be the diastolic. We notice that that's variable. There's a range. And so the average pressure we calculated is the what? The mean arterial pressure. And notice how it, um, the line doesn't completely split the middle of systolic and diastolic pressure. Your mean arterial pressure is physically a little bit closer to your diastolic pressure because your ventricle spends more time in diastolic. And that's why we had to do that two-thirds, one-thirds formulation on the mean arterial pressure. We can now turn our attention to figure 1321, looking at the volumes uh, in the ventricles. We just actually just kind of covered this as well. Uh, the, if the ventricle is filling up and relaxing, which valves are open? AV valves are open, but then the, the aortic or the pulmonary valves, the semilunar valves are closed. Eventually, we're going to have to overcome that acrimony to open up the semilunar valve. That pressure changes, then it closes the AV. That's just like a, a gated system. If we were to, the previous image, we were looking at uh, pressures. In this image, we're looking at volume. The volume of blood we know in the ventricle changes. If we uh, look at, what at the end of diastole, what do you think the volume is, big or low? At the end of relaxing and filling, the volume is probably really low. At the end of it. I'm oh. done filling up. Oh. I'm uh -huh. so your tank, right? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of diastole, you're filling your gas tank, right? But at the end of it, it's maximal. So the end of diastole, the volume of blood would be very full, okay, very high. What about at the end of systole? I just contracted and pushed all the blood out. At the end of end of systole, the volume of the lungs is very low. And so we're going to talk about some volumes. End diastolic volume. And in systolic volume, which one do you think uh, this one is? In diastolic, and this one must be in systolic. In systolic. Okay. So the in diastolic, at the end of diastole, we've maximally filled is a volume of blood. At the end of systole, we finish up contraction, we push out blood into the into the atria, so we have a, a lower volume. There's going to be some volume of blood left. These volumes are used to calculate what? What can we calculate? If I know how much blood fills and I know how much is left after systole, what can I calculate here? Very good question. You can use it to calculate your cardiac output. The stroke volume. The stroke volume. The stroke volume is the difference between your end diastolic and end volume. The difference between those, the end, or excuse me, the stroke volume, is the difference between how much blood it is filled in versus how much is remaining after contraction. That difference goes out into the pulmonary or into the systemic circuit. We didn't measure this last week. We didn't want to probe anybody's heart, right? We're not uh, cardiovascular surgeons yet. We're on our way, right? But we can, you, if you have the ability to measure it, that's how you calculate it. What I'm going to do is conclude our discussion here, and then we'll use the remaining of the time uh, to go over our exams, number three.